One of the ways that I like to begin talking about comprehensive strength assessment is to tell a story about a very bright young boy that I met a number of years ago who wasn't doing very well in school. And what he said to me is, they, found, they find out what I can't do, won't do, or don't like to do, and spend the rest of the school year beating me to death with it. We believe that comprehensive strength assessment means that we're going to look at many different aspects of a young person in addition to what we typically look at, which is mainly academic achievement. Um, in our work, we have defined what we call two types of giftedness. And one is the type that most people think about when they hear the word gifted and that is high achieving giftedness. They do well in school, they get their work done on time, they are good citizens of the school, and obviously that's important. However, the focus of our work, as I mentioned in an earlier uh, video, is that we want to look at what we call creative productive giftedness. And a short definition is simply that Young people are going to apply their skills and talents to produce something, whether it be a written piece of work, it be a video, uh, a scientific experiment, an artistic product. And so keep that in mind as we move along. The school-wide enrichment model is mainly dedica dedicated toward creative productive giftedness. The work is based on a theory that I developed in the 1970s, uh, which is called the three ring conception of giftedness. And what this theory talks about is the fact that people who have made important contributions to all walks of life, whether it's the sciences, the arts, the humanities, are comprised of three interlocking clusters of ability. And the first one was the one that surprised me the most. Many of these people were above average, but not necessarily superior in ability. And that, that's something to take into account when we use, say, a 130 IQ cutoff score to admit someone to a gifted program. The second ring on the lower left, creativity, the idea to raise questions that other people haven't raised, to look at ideas in new and different ways, to be very playful with one's mind. Uh, what would happen if or how can I change or modify this to improve it or make it better? There's lots and lots of literature written on just the definition and descriptions of creativity. The third ring is what I called task commitment. And you should think of task commitment as a refined or focused form of motivation. In psychology, the word motivation is usually applied to general areas. You're motivated to be a good parent or a good teacher or a good member of your church. Task commitment draws upon the same source of energy, but it's energy that's focused on something very, very particular, a job, a task, a project, something that you're working on. When these three, th three rings interact, we produce at the center of the diagram what I refer to as gifted behaviors. That is, the person is going to use lots and lots of different kinds of skills and talents and abilities to make something happen in a particular area of interest. I've been asked on many, many occasions, which one do I think is the most important? And that's why we have the little quote in the upper left. You could have the best ideas in the world or you could be the smartest person in the world in math or science or any other subject area. But unless you're willing to focus on this with lots and lots of energy, it's unlikely that you're going to come up with new ideas or better ways of doing things. Um, the little diagram at the upper right points out something that relates to questions I've been asked all the time. If someone's gifted, are they always gifted, or are they, on the other hand, never gifted? Are they gifted all the time? ICP stands for in certain people. There are many, many people who can go and make important things happen in the world, but I've never said all children are gifted. Rather, I believe that all children have potentials. ACT stands for at certain times. It's not like they're gifted in everything they do all of the time. 
And if you read the biographies, as I have done in the autobiographies of highly creative and productive people, they will always talk about the fact that they've had high points and low points. WCC stands for within certain contexts. Most of the people in the world who have made gifted contributions, and please, please note that I like to use the word gifted as an adjective, have made those contributions in very particular areas. There's very few people in history that have been good artists, scientists, writers, speakers, uh, mathematicians. It's usually a particular area of focus. And this is one of the reasons why in our work, we always look for very, very strong interest in young people. So it's all three rings interacting. Something else that's important about this diagram is that where above average ability tends to remain constant over time, especially traditional academic abilities, creativity and task commitment are not always present nor absent. They're very situational. They also feed upon one another. A person gets a good idea and said, wow, I'd like to do something about that. And so we see those circles coming together. Or they have a strong interest. We should do something about the parking issues related to this uh, campus or uh, bullying issues in school. And that then causes them to start to look for creative ideas about solving these problems. So the most important thing I can say about the three ring conception of giftedness is it's very interactive. In this diagram, we also point out the same thing. It's the three ring brought to bear on a particular either general subject area or a specific topic. And you see these topics listed in the bottom area of the chart. In our work, we talk about two kinds of assessment. The first is the difference between assessment of learning you know what this is all about, the kinds of things that we basically teach young people that they ordinarily memorize, prepare for tests, and obviously this is important, and the assessment for learning. And our focus has really been on this second area, the kinds of things that relate to the chart that you see on the lower left, interest, curiosity, learning styles, expression styles, all of these kinds of things tell us what are some of the kinds of things that we can do with young people to develop their gifts and talents. And so keep in mind as we move throughout this, and I'll sh be sharing some instruments with you, we're always looking for these kinds of things that tell us what kind of a learner a young person is and how in special programs and services and curriculum we can capitalize upon these kinds of things to improve learning for an individual. I love this quotation uh, by Donald Campbell. It is better to have imprecise answers to the right questions than precise answers to the wrong questions. Yes, we can measure IQ very precisely, and we can measure achievement very precisely. However, the kinds of things like interests and learning styles and curiosity, we can't be as precise about those things, but those are the things that I think are the right questions we should be asking when it comes to developing talents in young people. There are two types of identification information also that we use in our work. And the first is called status information. And that's anything you can put down on paper even before you've met a child. Their scores, their grades in schools, teacher ratings, and all of those kinds of things. And those are important. However, the second and the one that we use really to get young people started on highly advanced projects is what we call action information. That is, there are things that you can only document when they're happening or after they've happened. And we have an actual procedure that we use for documenting action information. We informally call it the light bulb. And basically, it's a message that the student can write himself or herself a teacher can write it, a parent can write it, it can be sent to anybody that might become a guide or a mentor for that young person. So here's one that's an example. 
Uh, Stephen, Stephen G. is driving me up the wall. He has an idea to create a solar car, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea behind this, this came from a regular classroom teacher to uh, the teacher of the gifted, who at that time was Sally Reese. And Sally said, wow, this is a great project. And she then started working with this young man in order to develop a solar car. So that's a nice example of just how action information can lead us in the direction of capitalizing upon a young person's strengths. Um, I love this quotation by uh, Dr. Paul Brandwine, considered to be the father of the study of science of high potential young people. By their deeds ye shall know them, by the things that they do. And so as we give more children opportunities to do enrichment activities through type one and type two enrichment, and obviously regular curricular activities as well, we can see the kinds of things they do and that points us in the direction of where we can carry out high-level follow-up. Now, our identification system follows a series of steps which you see on the screen. Obviously, we want to get our highest scoring students into any kind of special program that might be available. But we also want to take a look at the second group, the next 15, 20 percent, below the top 5 percent. And by the way, by doing this, we've been able to develop talent in a lot more young people who are, uh, come from uh, uh, low-income and minority groups. Even in the bottom part of the chart, we have found people, you'll see in just a minute, who were not very good at school. School was not a great place for them, and yet at the same time, they were able to do some outstanding work. For example, here we have Thomas Edison, America's most famous inventor, who only went to the fourth grade. He was considered to be, the expression in those days was addle-minded, uh, thought to be not very smart by his uh, teachers and even his father. His mother was the only person that had any uh, faith and gave him a lot of support. Uh, here we have Richard Branson, the founder of Virgin Airlines. and. Uh, he actually has a learning disability. If you listen to his TED talk, he'll talk about the fact that school was not a very successful place. And, and yet he is responsible for all of the innovations that have taken place in the airline industry. We also have here Temple Grandin, who has high functioning autism and yet is the world's leading authority on the humane treatment of animals that are raised for food. And she's published 15 books. She gives lectures all over the world about the more humane treatment of animals. And by the way, has spoken at many, many conferences on gifted education where she talks about her struggle. If you wanna do something that's really great to help young people appreciate the work of people like Temple Grandin, there is a movie about her, and I believe it's called, just called Temple. Uh, and here is Steven Spielberg, considered to be a very, very poor student. Uh, he struggled with just about everything in school. It wasn't until his mother bought him a wind-up 8-millimeter camera that this interest in film developed, and he went on, obviously, to become a very, very famous filmmaker. And so we're casting our net a little bit wider in our identification process to make sure that we get people like uh, Thomas Edison and Steven Spielberg and Temple Grandin and Richard Branson. Um, this next example is one that I really like. This is Sir John Gurdon, and he is the winner of, an, of the Nobel Prize uh, in medicine. And if you look closely, you'll see that on his desk, he has a framed picture of a letter. And this is a letter that was written by one of his teachers. And I'll just flash the letter up. And I know it's hard to read, and so I typed it up. And what it tells is that he is not a very successful student. Uh, and he uh, didn't do a lot of uh, work that the teacher requested, as you see in blue there, because he wanted to do it in its own way. And the last line points out that he has uh, ambition of becoming a well-known scientist, but 
on the basis of his present showing, this is quite uh, 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 ridiculous. And so, again, here are people that gifted programs would have missed if they just looked at very traditional approaches to identification. Um, in our work, we've developed several things that relate to more comprehensive stress, uh, strength assessment. I call them the big five. Obviously, we're going to look at academic strengths, and we do this not just by tests, but also by a series of teacher rating scales that we've developed. We've developed a series of, interest, uh, of instruments called interestalizers, and as I've said before, I think interest is the major key in unlocking talent, whether it's an interest that a child already has or that we can develop in that child through some type one or type two enrichment experiences. The next item, uh, keep our Nobel Prize winner in mind as I mentioned this, is learning styles assessment. Not all children learn in the same way. And then the next one is uh, expression style assessment. Everybody that we know that's creative and famous for their work have expressed themselves in different ways. One person may be a writer, another person might be a painter or artist or photographer, another person might be a bench chemist, but they express themselves in different ways. And then also assessment of co-cognitive factors uh, such as uh, organization skills, uh, leadership skills, working collabor collaboratively skills, all of those kinds of things are things that we want to take a look at as we try to identify young people for whom special opportunities, resources, and encouragement should be made available. Our instruments run across a broad range. You see there uh, teacher ratings, product ratings, interest assessment, etc. The one in the lower right is a relatively new one that we'll be talking about later on. It's the world's first machine scorable creativity test. Creativity tests have been a problem because uh, they always have to be uh, scored by hand, human scoring. Uh, so here are some just some very quick examples, uh, kinds of questions that we might ask in an interestalizer. Uh, here's some uh, instruments that relate to uh, learning styles and expression styles. And uh, we've also developed some primary versions for this that are easy for young children to respond to, even if the teacher has to read the items and then they check off the happy face and not so happy face to indicate their response. To me, interest is the starting point of the development of great talent. Uh, we try to summarize all of this information on a single sheet. Again, notice the title. We call it the Strengthalizer so that you can sit down and have a look at all of the different areas where a young person has uh, strengths. Um, I want to end with this slide because it does point out something that is very prevalent in the field today, and that is the underrepresentation of low income and minority groups. The first line points out that every school has a certain pace to its regular curriculum. In a rich school, a school that serves high income students, uh, we find that the curriculum moves at a faster pace. In an, aver um, uh, in an average achieving school, it moves at sort of a middle pace. And yet, in that school, there are young people who have higher potential. In a high-achieving school, as I mentioned, it moves at a faster pace. But even in that school, there are many young people that can move at a more advanced rate. But even in a low-achieving school, it doesn't move as fast at, as at fast a pace as the other schools. But even in those schools, we have young people that needs some kind of special opportunities to advance their skills and talents. And so I believe that the best way to address the problem is to always look at local norms. In a low achieving school, I don't want to be comparing those kids with a national average or with the averages in high or average achieving schools. I want to know who are the highest 
potential children in that low achieving schools. And it is for those young people, again, that we should be providing with special opportunities, resources, and encouragement. We will again, in the, the uh, SEM uh, school toolkit, uh, provide you with some articles that deal with the problem of underrepresentation. Thank you very much.